Kurt Hansen from Rain and from Anchor Radio, and um, your host for the radio track today. And I'm glad you're here. This should be one of our best panels of the day, Radio of the Future. It's an A-list uh, panel of experts that's checked the forecast and looked at the demographics and the dollars at stake, and they're here to deliver a verdict on radio's long-term future. Um, there's the question of whether traditional radio is endangered or whether the digital noise has distracted us from a lot of really strong and enduring vital signs. So it's a big question that almost everyone has an opinion on, but this group um, has some very knowledgeable and informed ones. Um, so we hope to get to as close to the answer as possible. Uh, we will introduce the moderator um, and the panel in just a few moments, but first we're going to hear from, from one of North American Radio's most successful and innovative group heads. Um, a guy who will, um, that I am a huge fan of, he will let you know what he and hopefully you is doing what he's doing to prepare for the future. Um, so please welcome the CEO and Chairman of MS Broadcasting, Jeff Smollian. Kurt, thanks. Um, I, um, I always talk about Next Radio, and for that I have um, won the title of Most Boring Man in the United States, and I'm up here today to see if I can win the Canadian version. But really want to tell you why we've concluded that activation of the FM chip is critical, and I want to do it in a couple minutes and show you a quick video. I was drafted six and a half years ago by a, a series of people in the industry to look into activating the FM chip. And as I discovered it, I found out that it checks all the boxes for our future. I really believe that this is the single most important thing we could do, and in 10 minutes today, I'm going to explain why. We all stream. I've been streaming for 20 years. I'm very happy to be on the iHeart platform and tune in, and our stations do that, but we've never unlocked the key to making money in streaming. So I'll briefly tell you the challenge we face. I, I use one example. We've got a radio station in Los Angeles. The cost of sending our over-the-air signal is $39,000 a year. That's our cost of electricity. If we were to take our transmitter down and just stream, our cost to reach our listeners in Southern California would be a million dollars a year. That's just data costs. Their costs would be more than a million dollars a year because we buy data in bulk and they don't. Now that's before we get to this nasty little problem of music licensing which we have in the States, which is not quite as pronounced up here. Not only that, there are no barriers to entry. So not only are my cost $39,000 versus several million, but anybody can stream and compete with me every day. In the over-the-air ecosystem, I'm one of 25 broadcasters in Southern California. So that's why we said, hey, this is important. One other thing we said is, it looks like the world's moving in our favor. Why do I say that? Because today in the United States, and I think the numbers are probably similar in Canada, 61% of the public is data metered. That means 39% still have unlimited data plans we see behavior is dramatically different. When you have an unlimited data plan, you stream all day, all day long. If you saw the connected car study uh, session earlier today, they talked about the fact that all of these things are wonderful, but there's a cost. And what we find over and over again is when people start realizing they pay for data, they get very cautious about their use. It gives over-the-air broadcasting, which is free, and our major, absolutely major opportunity, a tremendous ability to compete in any device, but especially the smartphone. Now, I will briefly tell you that as an industry, we decided that number one, we had to get the chips turned on. A few years into the project, we found out that we had to do more than that. We had to compete, com create a compelling ecosystem. What we've created, and I'll show you in a minute, is Next Radio. Next Radio was born of the NAB and a number of broadcasters. Um, we had either the good fortune or bad fortune to build it, um, but we told the NAB we would build it. I have been incredibly gratified. The most exciting thing that I've done in my career is launch this and see how consumers behave. We know that the average PPM session in the United States is 9 minutes and 30 seconds. The average Next Radio session, and we're up to about 2.5 million people, is 18 minutes. If we could be in every smartphone in the United States and in Canada, 
a medium that was portable and sold 25 million, or excuse me, 45 million Walkman in the United States 20 years ago, and probably a commensurate amount here, but stopped selling them, can become portable in every device that people carry with them 24 seven. They look at their smartphones 135 times a day. Wouldn't it be great if every one of us had our radio stations there in a compelling ecosystem and it was the only free choice they had? So with that, let's uh, rather than explain more about what we did with Next Radio, let's roll the video. Change it because I love you. excited by the response, not only in the United States, but in, in Latin America, North America, and other places around the world. We think it checks the following three boxes that are critical for our industry. And we think it checks them for one major reason, and that is that it capitalizes on our strength that we've had for almost 100 years, interactivity. We're with people, we're part of their lives, and everything that we've done over the air, whether it's promotions or contests or disc jockey, involvement or commercials or music information, we can do that in a visual way in the palm of their hand simultaneously to when they're hearing it on the ear. So we've said there's three reasons why we think this is critical to our future and I, you haven't had quite the economic downdraft in Canada that we've had in the United States, but none of us is exactly um, writing the, the great waves of cachet um, that some of our digital brethren have. We always laugh. We still are a profitable business. We have no cachet. They haven't found a way to be profitable, but they have a lot of cachet. Hopefully, we'll find the answer on our side. But three boxes that it checks. Number one, it changes listening. As I've said, the average next radio session is almost twice the average PPM session. Why? Because people look at that screen and they see songs coming up, they dial down information about the artists, they find out when their concerts are occurring, stations are doing interactivity with contests, we think that will only continue to grow as the ecosystem builds. So we know that if we're in 300 million devices in the United States and 50 million devices in Canada, with the one thing that people carry in their hands and we're the only free choice in a world in which they start becoming very cognizant of data costs, we think it's a tremendous opportunity, and that's what we've seen through the first two and a half million phones that have it in the States. Second thing, and this is really critical to our economics, and that is we can now do interactive advertising, and we can do it in our own ecosystem. When we did the deal with Sprint, Sprint said, do you have any idea what happens when you marry your local power of marketing and promotion in your markets, your 30,000 salespeople on the street, your call to action with our back channel. And we said, we don't know, but they said, trust us, it will be big. Since we rolled it out, we started talking to major ad agencies. We're now at the tipping point where we can start doing major interactive campaigns. Our first one in the United States was with Allstate. But obviously, if we can sell an interactive component, let's just take a, a local client. Do you have Tim Hortons in Canada? Okay, you do. So let's assume Tim Hortons runs their normal radio spot and they're offering a special on uh, donuts and coffee. 
At the same time, you can sell them an interactive spot. Runs alongside, the spot runs on the radio, but it comes up in your, in your smartphone, maybe ultimately in your car, maybe ultimately on your tablet or your clock radio. And you see that, you hit a button, you download a coupon, or if you don't know where the nearest Tim Hortons is, I, I think in Canada you just walk five blocks and you'll find it, but, but if you don't, you can download a map. And the idea is that we can do everything interactively and visually. Uh, advertisers tell us they'll pay a much higher price. My ultimate dream is that instead of running 16 units an hour, we'll run eight, but six of them will be interactive and we'll make more money and eliminate our cl cl clutter problems. So we think that's game-changing economically for the industry. And then the third thing, and this may be the biggest issue of all, we have been told by millennials and researchers that we are not cool. Radio is not cool, nobody cares. We see it in the United States on Wall Street, Madison Avenue, you see it everywhere. What we found in the research with the next radio application is people see it and they go, oh, that's cool. We've got like a 93% cool factor among millennials. I can't tell you how important that single factor alone is to our future. So I'm up here because we, we spoke to the NABA conference and people said, come back, we need to do this here, I hope you do. Um, and if you don't do ours, build your own. But I will tell you, I think this is our future. We think that if we can be interactive in the palm of people's hands, in the one device that's free that they look at every instant, and if you have teenagers, you know they look at it more than 135 times a day. We think it's a game changer, and we think that an industry that's been vibrant for 95 years becomes more vibrant in the next 95 years. So with that, I thank you. Thank you. Do you come back and introduce the panel? What do I do now? Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, to lead the panel, let's welcome one of Canada's best known broadcasters. Um, he has recently added a gig with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, which is seasonal work, short seasonal work. <laughs> um, let's give him a big hand to Alan Cross. And come on up here. Oh, well. Uh, here we go again, I think for the last six or seven years, somebody has stood up here and talked about uh, the future of radio, radio of the future, and every time we've had different answers, um, sometimes different questions, but basically we come back to the same thing over and over again, and that you know, radio has been around for a hundred years, it's been challenged by things like movies and television over the decades. Now we're dealing with uh, the internet and video games and gaming consoles and satellite radio and MP3s, non-demand TV and YouTube and Facebook and streaming and the connected car and all that sort of stuff. Uh, bottom line though is that for most of us, the vast majority of us, it's still a one-way analog delivery system that isn't customizable by the end user, at least not in its familiar form. But we have this huge ecosystem, this gigantic infrastructure of people and resources and buildings and real estate and equipment that needs to evolve. And we're not gonna let it die. We're going to evolve. But you know, how? How is radio gonna evolve? When is it gonna evolve? Uh, how much is this going to cost? What's gonna be the cost in human capital? I mean, you go to a, an announcer today at a radio station, they go, Oh, you want me to do more? I mean, I'm already on the air, I'm already Facebooking, I'm already Twittering, I'm already answering the request lines, I'm uh, already dealing with text messages, I'm doing voice tracking for the show on the weekend, and uh, now you want me to do something more like a podcast or something else beyond it? Well, maybe, I don't know. Uh, there are no shortage of ideas as to how we can turn radio into this new, next generation, full service media experience. Uh, I'd like to show you something that uh, we're working on at Chorus Radio. Um, I've been hosting a radio program called The Ongoing History of New Music uh, since 1993, which is languishing on hard drives mostly someplace because we can't work out the licensing issues to make it available on demand, which is a problem that everybody has and that's something that we need to deal with going forward. But we, uh, you know, radio being what it is these days with um, uh, the internets and uh, delivery systems, we can turn radio into something with pictures. So here's just a, a short little clip of some of the things that, that we're working on, of course. Go ahead. This is the ongoing history of new music with Alan Cross. Here's a big word mystery. How did the word grunge ever come to describe a sound and musical movement from the U.S. Pacific Northwest? Now, there are plenty of theories. 
The earliest use of the word seems to have been in the writings of Lester Bangs, the legendary and dead rock critic. But then came a letter to the editor of a Seattle music paper written as a joke by a member of a band that would later be called Mudhoney. He used the word grunge to describe the sound of a fictional band. But then other people suggest that Led Zeppelin drummer John Bottom should get part of the credit. He wrote a song called The Crunge for the band's 1973 album Houses of the Holy. Since grunge was influenced by the sludgier side of bands like Zeppelin, maybe the word grunge was just a modification of the word crunch. Bottom line is that no one really knows where the word came from. The Ongoing History of New Music with Alan Cross. So those are uh, daily one-minute features that we run as part of a syndication package that we have. Uh, we've got uh, something like 5,700 of them and we would like to turn them into pictures. So we're slowly going through each of the 5,700 things that I wrote and voiced over the years and turning them into, into cartoons like that. So is that future? Maybe, maybe it's part of it. We have a panel here that's gonna tell us a lot about the future of radio. I'm just gonna let you guys go down the panel. You've already heard from Jeff. So let's just go down the panel. Everybody introduce yourselves because you've got much longer resumes than I could ever do justice for. I'll do an abbreviated version. I'm Darren Davis. I'm the president of iHeartRadio. I oversee uh, digital for iHeartMedia. Uh, I'm uh, James Cridland, one of the two British Jameses uh, on your panel this afternoon. Uh, I call myself a radio futurologist primarily because it, I, I discover if you print your own business cards, you can call yourself anything. <laughs> I'm Gavin McGarry, I'm the president of Jumpwire Media. We are a social agency uh, that only does uh, TV, radio, and newspapers around the world, and we do all the strategy for many of the big brands you've heard of. I'm Paul Kramer, I'm the EVP of Publisher Development for North America for Triton Digital, and we help broadcasters connect their audience to online audio and connect that audio to advertisers. Hi, I'm the other James uh, from Britain on the panel. So I'm James Sterling. I head up the relatively new BBC Music department back in London. So my role is really to, to bring music to the forefront of the BBC through television, radio, and digital content. All right, let's let's begin without sounding desperate. Um, let's just reaffirm that terrestrial radio is still a powerful and profitable business. Agreed. Agree. Totally agree. Okay. But, like I said in the opening, we have to think towards the future. There are many things coming at us from many different directions, the internet, the connected car, and so on. Uh, but what right now, what right now is draining audiences away from radio? And it is happening slowly, but what, what sort of things are draining audiences away? Well, I'll tell you what we found is that our strategy, our core strategy when we built iHeartRadio four years ago was simply to extend the brand of our 850 owned terrestrial stations and those of our partners like Emmis and, and Cumulus and others. Uh, and, and the backbone of that strategy is to make sure that iHeartRadio and therefore those broadcast brands can be found anywhere and everywhere. Every handheld device, every tablet, every computer, every auto uh, dash, gaming consoles, wristwatches now, because sometimes reaching into your pocket to grab your phone is just too much trouble. Now you can access radio right from your wristwatch. We want to be everywhere, and, and I think that's the key. And because of that, what we found is the listening that we're seeing through iHeartRadio has really largely been additive. It, it is not siphoning off the broadcast ratings of Z100, KISS FM, and, and all the other great terrestrial stations. It's been additive. Okay, anybody else have the same experience? We need to define radio now. Okay, we're, we're talking about traditional, terrestrial, over-the-air, AM and FM. Why is, that in, why is that important? Why are we talking about radio? Why aren't we talking about proper radio? We all understand what proper radio is. It's, uh, we understand it as soon as we hear it. Why do we care about whether it comes from a stick, or whether it comes from a stick using uh, FM, or AM, or HD, or, or, or online, or anything else? Why do we actually care? Well, I'm, I, as a broadcaster, I don't care where it comes from. All I care is that it works. I do care that we have this giant infrastructure of AM, FM radio stations that need to evolve. So we need to move beyond this little comfort zone that we've had for the past hundred years into something, something else. Well, to answer James' statement, the listener doesn't care. The listener's got to be happy. On the other hand, let's make no mistake, broadcasters do care because as we say on the over-the-air business, every time I take a listener from over-the-air to streaming, I take a 40% margin customer and make them a minus five. So broadcasters who run stations and run groups 
are trying to find out, is there a way to strengthen the terrestrial system where they know they make money as opposed to the digital ecosystem where they haven't found an answer yet? Right, so we, we, you know, we deal with shareholders all the time and they're all thinking, okay, you gotta move forward into the new digital realm, but what's the ROI on that? We, uh, we know what the ROI, we know what the margins is, are on, on terrestrial radio, but you know, they want us to move forward, but then they're panicky about moving forward because it turns into a, a listener with a minus five margin. So, um, what do we do? Yeah. Well, let's talk brand erosion, right? So we've got all these major brands that have been around for 40 years. And if I go onto the street and I talk about, let's take about Canadian brands, the Toronto Star or Virgin Radio or any of the radio brands out there. If I walk out on the street, I can talk to an eight-year-old and I can talk to a 60-year-old and they'll probably know what I'm talking about. If I go to a specific demographic and ask them about, or if I ask everyone generally about Spotify, not everyone, 60 plus may not even know it exists. So I think that what we're really talking about here is that, you know, and I'm in the social space, that's all we deal with. We see with our radio brands, so much equity being eroded and being thrown away. They're just, well, we gotta go to streaming now, whereas on their Facebook pages, they've got massive engagement, people wanna be part of the brands. So wait, wait, Matt, let me just back up. You're saying that you're seeing the radio brands eroded. Who's eroding them? The brands themselves. The brands themselves, okay. Yeah, because they're saying, well, we don't, we don't wanna spend time, we wanna look at margins, I mean, the issue here is about fans and audience. We've moved from this place of being an audience to fans. And traditional brands, and this is not just, you know, it's TV, radio, and newspapers. You're now controlling a fan. You're, you're, you're talking about fans, not audience anymore. Audience is a broadcast idea. But fans are an engaged idea. So I don't care where I get your product from. I just want to be top of mind, right? My, the brands I work with, I want to keep them top of mind. And then when I engage with them, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or on a streaming service, anywhere, how can I get ARPU out of that? Okay, so it seems to me that one of the challenges that we have going forward is somehow consolidating all these different delivery systems of our brand. I don't right? think you need to do that at all. You don't? No. Okay. I, I just want it when I want it. If I decide to be on Spotify, um, I mean, iHeart's a perfect example, right? Just be everywhere. Like, if I want to get something on SoundCloud that's from your brand, if, if I want to go and listen to what you just put up there, which, you know, I'm a Canadian, even though I live in L.A., and I've been there for a while, is that, that I, I want to listen to it. I am not going to go and try and find it somewhere. I'm going to go to SoundCloud, right? Or I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to YouTube. I'm going to go and find it to listen to it. Now, can you monetize that brand? How can I spend more time with it? Can I go to iTunes and pay for it? I don't want to think. No one, no audience member, no fan wants to think about what they want to do. They just want to go and get it. And you know, a friend of mine, uh, you know, at Christmas gave his kids, eight years old, gave them radio boxes and said it's free music. These kids went crazy. He has videos up on his Facebook of kids running around. It's free. It's free. They didn't know what radio was, right? But I don't see any radio stations out there marketing this. All these kids out here have no idea that they can get free music because they're all conscious about the streaming. Right, as you point out. But I just find that inside the, I mean, our job is we're innovators and we think two years out and our job is to bring all these ideas to our broadcasters. And time and time again, I spend saying to them, you've got a massive audience out there. You're just letting them run away and go to a new brand. Innovation's a slippery slope and, and meetings like this can be dangerous as, as fancy folks like us all get in the room and talk about the next big thing. Yeah, we're kind of, a, kind of a bubble here. Well, and you read the tech press, I mean, it, You'd think that nobody was listening to the radio, nobody's watching television anymore, no one, no one uses CDs. Well, no one got the memo about CDs. 61% of Americans still listen to CDs in their car every, every yeah, week. I, I, they, I get really tired when I talk to some tech guy and he goes, you still listen to the radio? Well, yeah. You know, you're living in your little... We have to be careful not to try and force people more rapidly than they naturally want to migrate. But we need to be there so that when they're ready to migrate, we're there to catch them. I think that's really important too. I mean, I'm really privileged to be here with two broadcast groups, Emmis and iHeart, that have innovated and they're, they're cognizant that we just can't be immune to what's happening in our space either. As Jeff said, I mean, radio, on-air radio is still a great uh, business. It's a fixed cost business, knock on wood, depending on what happens uh, here with some of the things happening in the States. It's a high margin business. But at the same time, even though it's got great reach, we're starting to see attrition in TSL. And that's not only, not only due to uh, different audio substitutes, but just different media substitutes. There's different things competing for a share of time with, with all of our consumers. At the same time, though, we have companies out there that are offering greater customization, greater personalization choice, 
less commercial interruption, and they are operating some of those businesses as loss leaders or burning off private equity. So it is a little bit of a conundrum. So I think we do have to uh, protect the business we have now, but also look for the future and innovate. You know, one, one of the theories I have, and I, I hope I'm wrong, is that uh, in, in a lot of radio groups, we have this layer of executives who are in their upper 50s or lower 60s, and they're just, just hang on for another three or four years and my sh retirement shares will be vested, and I'll just leave it to everybody else to figure out. Um, I hope that's not the case because it is the case. We did the spreadsheet. Yeah. Yep. We really don't. No, I'm not kidding. Jesus. It's well. absolutely. You, you can see them fall off. It happened here in Canada. We looked across the top. They all retired. A new group came in. If your CEO isn't 35 to 40, you're not in the innovation business because we're bridging a gay. Uh, uh, you're bridging a gap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jim. I mean, the the, the the issue here is that we go in and talk. The, the, you know, how many people up here are still rocking blackberries? I mean, it's, it's, this is, we're talking yeah, about Let's, let's wait, 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 just water loose down the road here. We gotta be careful about that. You know, I know, again, feelings. and that's the radio business, right? We wanna protect what we've got. And we just did a thing for Cumulus. We t totaled up all their Facebook and Twitter pages, and we looked at if they posted 10 times a day to a video platform, they were leaving $5.5 .5 million just in social referrals to opportunities where they can deliver revenue. There is tons and tons of ready big revenue out there, but yes, the margins and where we're going, and I, I mean, I can just speak from experience. We're there every single day, right? And we, we know it's hard to change. It's hard to make these changes, but it's gotta happen, and it's gotta happen quickly. Okay. I just want to say one thing in defense. I am only 35, <laughs> but I've had the hell kicked out of me in American radio, so I look like 68. <laughs> Anybody else want to, want to weigh in on, on, on this particular topic before we move into something else? So one, one of the things that a lot of radio stations are doing that I've seen is that, uh, oh, uh, you're 25? Okay, you can be our social media expert. Oh, and God. see... The, there's what I talk about the cost of human capital, right? You can't give something as important as your social media engagement for your radio station, your brand, your cluster, your company, your division, uh, to somebody who is 25 and just happens to have uh, an iPhone 6. You give, your, you give your social media to the people you pay the most. What does that mean? So you've got a morning show, you're paying a million dollars a year, they are doing your social media. Now they may have a team of people that they dictate. You certainly don't let a 25 year old come out of college and put them on the air on a, in, a, in LA or any market. And when we go into radio stations, the first thing we ask is who's doing the social media? And it is, it's interns, they're damaging the brand. It's all these people that may know how to use Facebook. Facebook for business and Facebook for personal are two totally different things. And it makes me a little frustrated and angry when I go in and I talk to the social guys and everyone, you know, from the top is like, oh yeah, go talk to the social team over there. We, social doesn't really matter to us, doesn't generate any revenue. Meanwhile, we go through their social and we look at all the brand damage they're doing. They're talking about things that don't make any sense. And the people who should be doing it, the people you spend all the money on to connect with the audience, don't know how to do Facebook. Or they might be doing Twitter, which is a waste of time, right? It's incumbent upon people who manage radio stations on a day-to-day -day basis to help their staffs see the joy and keep sight of the joy of what they do all day. I mean, you, you talked about how now a program director, instead of programming one station like the good old days, programs two or three, and, and a DJ has to do an air shift, and they have to post to this, and they have to go do a remote, and they think, oh my goodness, I've got to program three radio stations. Well, I've, I've got news for it, all of us. If we walked out here onto the streets of Toronto and said to any poor soul out there who's got a jackhammer and a shovel, uh, good news, I'm going to pay you $150,000 and you get to program three of the city's top radio stations, they'd probably pee their pants with delight. They wouldn't say, three, my God, I'm going to do three. They'd be thrilled. Our last program director in Los Angeles is now operating a jackhammer in Toronto. So it <laughs> How old was he? And he's 35. <laughs> 37. Let, let me ask another question. How far behind is radio because we didn't recognize the power of the smartphone early? I mean, Ben Cooper from BBC Radio 1, Daily Mail yesterday says, we admit that we did not see the smartphone coming. So how much catch-up do we have to do here? I, 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 uh, we, uh, I'm sitting on this panel and I'm hearing you saying that we're losing audience, we're not. We're losing time, we're not losing audience. Now I'm hearing you saying, where have we gone wrong? Where have we gone wrong? 
we haven't gone wrong. Nine out of ten people in this country, in the US, in the UK, in Norway, in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Australia, tune into the radio every single week. Nine out of ten people. And we're standing here saying, where did, where did we go wrong? How have we fucked up our medium? I, I'm no, I, I, that's I not what I'm not saying. Understand. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying is that we're a, a strong and profitable business. And now you're quoting the, the Daily Mail, who hates the, the BBC because the Daily Mail ends up. I'm just reading what I read. Their money. Just you know, I mean, look. At the end of the day, this is this is one of the big issues with the future of radio. It's that we in the radio industry do not believe in our future, and if we don't believe in our future, we should get the fuck out, and we should give our future to somebody that does believe in our future. That's where we're heading. And I, you know, and I gotta say that. When we started Jumpwire six years ago, and we've been in social for five years, so I'm a grandfather in social. I mean, we've been doing it for so long. The first place we went, we didn't go to TV, we didn't go to newspapers, we went to radio. Because radio is the medium of the mind, but more importantly, the engagement on radio stations is off the charts. We've got, I won't say which country or which brand, 80% of the referrals coming from Facebook. They're doing $1.2 million a year just on Facebook, and they're a radio station. And I'm hearing this across the country, in San Diego, everywhere. And so for me, as I totally agree, is that I get so upset because my first passion is radio. I started this business, I've done radio, TV, and newspapers. That's why we consult to those, because I know those. We don't consult the brands or anything else because I believe in radio and I come to this conference, I come all the time and I agree. I don't think we should be apologizing for it. This is one of the most connected mediums on the planet still and people want to get with, people, with the brands, whether the brand is 40 or 60 years old, I think we've got some ageism going on. We think we're not hip and cool because we're in the radio business, but that is not the case. That's quite possible, but again, at the outset, I did say that we are profitable and powerful. What we need to do is maintain our profitability and our power and it's going to have to, we just can't rely on an analog delivery system going, you know, ex exclusively going forward. We're going to have to do something new. So that's what we want to talk about here. But we haven't been talking about it for 10 long. years, though. We haven't been talking about what's new for 10 years. And, you know, you and I, just before we walked in here, we're going to talk about the same things we talked about last year. But, yeah, the right. answers changed, though. Yeah. So, so, I mean, we, you know, we were talking about the FM chip a number of years ago, but we weren't talking about the FM chip in the evolved way that Jeff was talking about. We were just like the old Zune, which had a tuner in it. That's not going to lead us forward. However, this next radio might. It's a really cool interface. So, you know, things are evolving, things are changing, and we are the people that are going to have to move that, this stuff forward. It's getting that user interface right and making sure that uh, however you consume radio, uh, it's making sure that radio is uh, easy to find, uh, is discoverable, and is the kind of user experience that we would, uh, that we would expect. And so, I think it's very, very interesting looking at uh, where we expect people to remember a number, 680, and then I'll find news, you know? Uh, that, that kind of user experience is not a fantastic user experience, and I think uh, making sure that the user experience is a great one on whatever device you're actually using radio on okay. is clearly part of where, where we need to be. Then maybe what we, we need to talk further about the interface. So what does radio, in whatever form, whatever delivery system, look like to the consumer, to the user? Is it, it's not a dial anymore, it may not be a, a digital reader anymore. What does it look like? Well, we, we've done a lot of research, which is the result of what you see there. We have been astounded at, at how, interest, how interested consumers are, because it's visual, it, you know, they interact with each station and can go deeper and deeper, but it's a very simple interface. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's the future. We have in Darren's company and ours had a little interesting debate about what that looks like in the car, we're working through that. But what we're seeing is, you know, we have the strong position because we're first and we're free. We got to make sure we don't screw that up. But look at iTunes. Let's take iTunes. People use iTunes every single day. What a piece of crap built by Apple, right? You try and get podcasts. I have still got podcasts on here that I have erased a year ago, right? That I don't want to listen to anymore. I can't get rid of them. You talk to the people at Apple. So we have a huge opportunity. The only thing that I see with radio is this massive opportunity. 
People are finding brands online and social in my world without us buying anything. Like you don't have to buy a Facebook fan. They're coming to find these brands, they love them. And then when you post a, a, a lot, do high frequency posting on Facebook and aren't scared of the medium and actually do what it's designed to do, they engage like you've never was seen before. We ask them, what do you want to hear? They tell, we, stuff is being broken on Facebook. Facebook is even experimenting with pushing a button and listening to the radio station. They've been talking about that for a while. Why don't we just pop, push on the radio station? So I think that radio itself is it, it's an exciting time. There's huge opportunities. And more importantly, which wasn't last year, that is this year, is there's a lot of money to be made from radio brands online, on social. Because people are doing it, and I've seen the numbers, and they're huge. The engagement's huge, and I don't tell this story as a commercial for iHeartMedia. It's not. It's more a, a it talk, speaks to the power of the connection radio has with, with its audience. Uh, in 2013, iHeartRadio was the number five brand on Facebook, behind Disney and I think ESPN and uh, Discover Channel. We're number five in terms of uh, number of likes and, and fans. But when you look at how people, how many people are interacting with the brand throughout the year, liking the pictures, commenting on posts, you know, Disney it would be 20%, uh, Discover Channel, people watch the TV show, 15%, of, 90 plus percent of the people who liked iHeartRadio had some occasion to interact with it. And, and that's because they love Elvis Duran, they love Ryan Seacrest, they love the disc jockeys, those are their friends. It, and it, 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 that is the power of what we've got. It's why the, the personalities, I think, are absolutely the backbone. They're our best offense and defense going forward. Well, okay, uh, one of the things that, let's just get the whole Norway situation out of the way. That was picked up by the press in an awful way. Uh, and in case you haven't heard, uh, the Norwegian government, as part of a, must be a 15-year initiative, has announced that they are gonna shut down all FM radio in the country and move to digital audio broadcasting. Is this Norwegian water? Uh, might be. I think it is. Naturally filtered. No, no, northern Quebec. I'm sorry. And, and that got picked up in... Northern Quebec, no way, you know. <laughs> that got picked up in the press and exploited and shown that, oh, say radio's dead because, it, you know, Norway's killing it. Well, let's, can we just address that and explain what's going on there, please? <laughs> so in Norway, what, what's happening is that they've turned off uh, FM broadcast radio uh, uh, for most of the radio stations there, not for all, but for most. Uh, and they're using DAB broadcast radio. So it's exactly the same, uh, it's, it's broadcast radio, it's through an aerial, it's free for you to get. You just need a decent, a decent radio, you tune in by numbers, uh, sorry, you tune in by names, not by numbers. Uh, and typically, a typical Norwegian would have a choice of uh, four national uh, radio stations on uh, FM. Now with DAB, they've got a choice of 22 national radio stations on DAB. Uh, so, you know, it's a big, big uh, change. Um, but I think what's really interesting is in Norway, and by the way, in uh, many other countries, in Australia, in the UK, online radio is really low in comparison to over-the-air radio. And over-the-air radio being either FM, uh, AM, the Norwegians turned that off years ago, or uh, DAB as well. So broadcast radio really fits because of all of the things that Jeff was saying earlier about the fact that it's free uh, in terms of consumption. Uh, it offers the brands that people know and, know and love anyway. Uh, and it just works. I think one of the things that we forget in terms of the user experience for radio is we've got the best user experience in the world. We have a button that is, uh, a, a device that is dedicated to radio in many cases with one button on it. And that button, uh, I think it says the word power on it, but you might as well change it to say, entertain me. And it's the entertain me button. You press it, it makes noise, it entertains you. When you've had enough, you press it again. It's the simplest, most straightforward user interface. Uh, and I think, you know, we can, we can improve that, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't change that to make it worse. Okay, let's talk about some of the features that we may see in radio in the future. What about personalized advertising? Is that a possibility for well, us? What NPR is doing in America, in America is amazing. Like, you can buy a stream during that awful sweeps or whatever they do where it's like they're constantly asking you for money. What's it called? Uh, pledge, pledge, drive. pledge drive. Yeah, yeah. the pledge, thank you, the pledge drive. Yeah. So you can now, you pay a certain amount. If you pledge a certain amount, you can listen to a stream that has no pledges. Okay, let's, let's forget about streams for a second. What about over the air? Can we, can we do uh, personalized radio over the air? We can do certain things. Yeah. Radio man, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain things that we can do, that we know we can do. Um, but, but again, you know, 
there's certain things that we learn in devices, whether it's automobiles or whether it's cell phones, to be able to personalize our message. So yes, we're getting there, but, but let's make no mistake, a one-to-many distribution mechanism can do certain things on a one-to-one -one basis, but the heart of what we do has to be one-to-many. That's our distinction. That's what makes us free. You gotta be careful about the personalization though too. I, I, I read this week a company is gonna allow users to personalize the, the music in the uh, broadcast station uh, stream, which on the surface seems neat, but it does start to tinker with the brand of the radio station. When Z100 suddenly has a Taylor Swift song replaced by a Green Day song, it starts to fool with the Z100 brand. Similarly, if you're listening to Z100 and you're getting ads for Viagra and Geritol, uh, why, why did you point to me and say Viagra? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> That changes the brand too, because the program director of Z100 uh, would never allow those ads on the air typically because it changes the overall vibe and the whole feeling of being part of that Z100 tribe. All right, so let's, 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 let's get it. I'm oh, sorry. There's some personalization actually in terms of broadcasting uh, already going on. So if you if you have a look in uh, London, for example, there's a radio station there called uh, Absolute Radio. It used to be called Virgin Radio. And what Absolute Radio is doing is a pop rock station. Um, but it has a lot of additional radio stations on DAB and online, um, which are uh, specifically around the decades. So absolute 80s, absolute 90s, absolute noughties, and so on. And they just play music from the same absolute radio database, but just limited to that particular uh, decade. Mm. So you've got a brand extension there already of all of these new radio stations which are playing uh, music which is still in brand. But what then happens is they have uh, their live breakfast show uh, you hear the same links, uh, they sell the advertising across the n network as well, and in terms of the songs, you hear a different song depending on what radio station you're actually having a listen to. So you'll hear the same breakfast show on Absolute 80s than you will on Absolute 60s, you'll just hear more Beatles on Absolute 60s than you will on Absolute 80s. Um, you know, Henry Ford once said that you could have any Model T Ford that you wanted as long as it was black. And that was a defining characteristic of the Industrial Revolution, was mass production one to many. Uh, fast forward to today, the defining characteristic of the Digital re Revolution is mass customization. And we're seeing that, of course, everywhere, not only in media, but also in shipping, in, in uh, retail, and so forth. So again, I think we've got to be cognizant of that. And to get back to your original point, I think personalized advertising is really important because if you look outside of our immediate industry, it's already happening. Uh, in video, in display, I mean programmatic, retargeting, uh, behavioral based targeting, psychographics, that's all things today that are a little bit far to our industry, but there's a lot of dollars flowing to those places that we need to be able to capture in audio as well too. Okay, let's see if we can sum up everything that we've talked about so far because we're running out of time. Uh, number one, uh, possibilities of the FM chip in, in radio. Uh, number two, um, higher engagement across multiple platforms and especially through social media. Uh, number three, we need to reinforce our marketing message that radio is free, local, and filled with personalities and things that you need to know. Uh, four, we need to, what else do we, what, have, what else have we covered? Um, Geritol. Uh, Geritol and Viagra on uh, Z100, yes. Um, Norway's weird. Uh, Norway's weird. <laughs> FM is profitable and powerful, or radio is profitable and powerful. They, they eat reindeer in Norway. It's the most amazing thing. It's delicious, by the way. It's delicious. <laughs> and also, and also, the other thing that we've that we've uh, that we've uh, talked about is not talking radio down, talking radio up, because because radio is doing tremendously well now and will do tremendously well in the future as long as we continue to innovate and as long as we continue to change radio as we've done over the, the last ninety hundred. Last, last, last a question bit about personalization. Okay, go ahead. No, we talked a little yeah. bit about personalization. Okay, well, one more. Uh, some, some, could you see some alliances and consolidations going on? For example, uh, Chorus Radio, uh, through its uh, sister company Shaw, actually has a equity position in Ardio. So we are embarking on a, on a partnership with Ardio to deliver a, an enhanced musical experience. Is that the wave of the future? Are we seeing stuff like that? Or could we? Or? Well, I think it absolutely is. I mean, if we look at um, AM, FM, over the air, simulcast streams, those are basically flat right now, where we're seeing uh, pure play streams take a nice hockey stick. Anybody like hockey here? Uh, hockey stick trajectory up. So, you know, on one side of the business, we have local radio or over the air radio, which is highly localized, highly 
uh, relevant, but little customization. On the other side, we have these digital pure plays that are very customized with no personality, no localization. So I think the sweet spot is going to be to get those two things to come together at an inflection point and marry the personalization with the localization that consumers desire. Okay, one last thing. Could we possibly see an increase in international radio brands? Absolutely. Yeah, when we worked with WBLS in New York City, I mean, we looked at all their data we, when we first went in there, and the number two place they came was Japan. They are huge in Japan. How do you monetize that? What? What? I think you meant to say they're big in Japan. Big in Japan, yeah, I didn't know that yeah. So, so, but how do you monetize that? How do you monetize that? Yeah. Well, there's two companies that currently one out of Australia, I believe one in America, that insert ads for that local area for Japan. So, um, and maybe you... See, I, that, that's one of the things I've run into with people who... WNYC. I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. WBLS in, but, but, and that's your but, station, right? But you know, I mean, I own that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we are, how did no, they just bought it. We, we, didn't, we worked with them before they were bought by oh, Okay. Us. Yeah. And it's a great brand. We're just having a hard time making money at it. We, you know, we, I told we're, you we're big in Japan. We're big in a lot of places. We just, we don't, yeah. we lose money there. Number one global brand, I, I, and we should talk after because we have a whole report for you. Number one, WBLS drives more music listening around the world because they set the trends. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff that, and for a global brand, it's one for us that you should definitely look at. But yeah, you nice have, <laughs> it's a huge brand. I hey, think. listen, yeah. maybe, the, maybe the BBC on the, is gonna be the, um, an even bigger global brand than it is right now because I plugged my new cell phone into my wife's new car and a, a pop, uh, uh, an app called AHA popped up. And I, what, what's this? Two stations, six music, boom, there it is. Wow, how cool. So maybe you guys are I way ahead of us. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I think for the BBC, it's, we're so focused on public service radio in the UK that we forget the power of the brand of the BBC when we come to North America. So I come and stand here and talk to people and, and you suddenly realize how big the BBC is, ex-UK. For us, I think it's a, certainly a branding opportunity. Um, a lot of my work at the moment is looking at global opportunities for BBC Music and how we can deliver some of the great content that we're delivering in the UK to other territories. I think there's a national affinity within North America with some of the artists, with the, the way that British artists are doing so well, particularly in North America at the moment. I think five out of the ten top-selling uh, artists in North America last year were British. So there is an opportunity. And no advertising. You've got to throw Yeah, I mean, that's our, our key selling point, obviously, and that changes when you take it out of the UK. But I think it is a big opportunity for us, and actually it's just finding the right ways to do it. And Radio 1, for example, you mentioned Radio 1 earlier, they, they had a presence on Sirius a few years ago, and that's, that's not really there anymore. But, but think... that was fantastic because it was time-locked to my time zone. So yeah. if it was 4.15 p.m. in London, the stream that I was getting was timed to 4.15 p.m. in Toronto. That was cool. No, it's neat. I mean, that's the kind of, I think personalization is key to a lot of this. I think it's the one thing actually that can preserve uh, the popularity of radio for many years to come. And if we can get that right in terms of making the content that you want to listen to at the time that you want to listen to it, on the platform you want to listen to it, and that's the best way to go. It's about finding the right generation for the right platform as well. And Finally. And I think when you, when you were talking about international radio uh, uh, brands, you, you already have one, of course, Virgin Radio, which is uh, international all, all over the place. The one thing that really confuses me about North American radio is that there aren't very many national brands. Uh, the, there's, you know, WPLJ in New York, but, but, but nowhere else. There's, there's Kiss in LA. There are lots of other Kisses all over North America, and they're all different, and they're run by different people, and they have different logos and everything else. That really confuses me. It's a long, and I think complicated you can, history. You can yeah, have a look, of course, but I think you can, you well, can have a look at, uh, at uh, NRJ uh, across Europe, you can have a look at Capital and Heart across the UK, you can have a look at all of these uh, national and international brands already going on. I think it would really help broadcast yeah. radio in n North America if if there were more national brands. Interesting point. We're, we're getting the hook. We're five minutes over. Thank you, everybody. This has been tremendous. Remember, radio is still very profitable.